Hello. I'm here to talk to you today about practical implications, a look at cataloging a book using the new RDA toolkit. I'm Kathy Glennon, chair of the RDA steering committee, and my day job is as head of original and special collections cataloging at the University of Maryland. I need to start with some disclaimers and assumptions, because as you know, the new toolkit is still in its beta form, and it should not be used for cataloging, because it's not ready. However, there's enough there that we can work through this example today with you. The new toolkit is still in beta, as I said, and although the English text is stabilized, revisions and improvements are still coming to both the text and the functionality. And that will even continue once it is official. But the most important part here is that application profiles, policy statements, and or best practices still need to be developed by RDA communities for use with, for catalogers, which are specific to those communities' needs. And those do not exist yet. Thus, it is not possible to give a true demonstration of practical cataloging until all of these pieces are in place. You'll have to work with me on this today. I will do the best I can using the current version of the beta site with a simple English language monograph. And I emphasize simple in quotes because as all catalogers know, there is no such thing as a simple thing to catalog. The examples I'm giving you today will be presented as metadata description sets, and they will not be in a specific encoding format. Now for the assumptions. My assumption is that there is an appropriate application profile that I can use that's designed for using when I'm cataloging a simple monograph with a single personal author. This mythical application profile has data elements and specifies their display order that largely mirrors what I do in ISBD right now. The choices and recording methods, where there are choices, mirror what my institution currently does. The application profile allows me to use catalogers' judgment in specific situations, including supplying elements beyond those specified or required in my application profile. And the system, whatever that system is, will supply actionable links between the related metadata description sets that I create. Let's take a closer look at this application profile that I've come up with for the monograph and a single author. And there are four different pieces of it, manifestation, expression, work, and author. I've set this up as a very simple table, which tells me the element name in RDA, whether or not as a cataloger I'm required to supply it or required to supply it if it's applicable, whether or not it's repeatable, and what recording method I'm supposed to use. This is specific to my set of institutional preferences, my application that I'm cataloging it in, all sorts of things come into play here. For the most part, you will see that I'm using both structured and unstructured descriptions. Structured descriptions are when I'm taking a term from a list. Unstructured descriptions are largely when I'm transcribing from a source. The manifestation elements are the longest list because that's the bulk of where my description is for this simple monograph. Some of the things on this list are not going to be used in my particular situation because they are not applicable. For example, title of series and all those things related to series are not applicable because I managed to pick an example that doesn't have a series statement. You'll see that identifier for manifestation is the only recording method I'm using that's identifier and not structured or unstructured. Moving on to expression elements, some of these are new in the beta RDA, such as preferred title of expression and authorized access point for expression. I'm having to make up a few things about what these are supposed to look like because I don't have an existing policy to follow. And if you're familiar with 
traditional AACR2 cataloging or you work in MARC and especially in bibliographic versus authority records, some of the things you see here in expression elements seem a little weird, such as illustrative content. However, this is actually what you do in the current RDA, the original RDA. So just because it's a little strange, depending on your background, it's this part is not new. The work elements have mostly what you would expect. Um, author person might look a little weird to you, but it is a new element name in the beta toolkit, and it's relatively descriptive in any case. These are the things I would be using to describe a work. Subject is structured, and I'm going to give you an example of how I would approach subject for my book, but I'm not going to go into great detail because I'm going to use a vocabulary external to RDA for that. And then I have the person elements. These are largely what I would do right now if I were creating an authority record in Mark 21. So let's take a look at the cataloging example. What I have for you today is Bibliotech, Why Libraries Matter More Than Ever in the Age of Google by John Palfrey. It's published in New York by Basic Books, which is a member of the Perseus Books Group. On the title page Versa, you see that I have a copyright date of 2015. That's nice because I don't have a publication date. There is no such thing on this. That's important to remember later. The presentation of the title will come into play and come up a couple of times in the discussion what I give you later. So pay attention here. Is this one word or two? And how am I going to present that? Getting started. So before I even start, I have to decide what order I'm going to use in creating these metadata description sets. Really, RDA is a choose-your-own-adventure in the beta toolkit. You can start in whichever one of these places that makes the most sense for you and your workload, your work approach, whatever. In my particular case, I'm going to start with the manifestation. Then, because I do want to do work and expression, I need the author because I know that my work access point is going to require an author. So I want to start with the author and then move on to work. And I want to do work before I do expression because I want to build my expression access point based on the work access point. So for me, this order makes sense. But your mileage may vary. I also need to know what transcription method I'm going to use. I've chose normalized transcription, which is the most common approach for transcription for North American catalogers. Let's take a closer look at these manifestation elements as they apply to my work. First of all, I'd like to emphasize that all I'm doing here is giving you the parts of the instructions and the element page as they apply to the item that I have in hand. Media type, definition and scope, is a categorization reflecting the general type of intermediation device required to view, play, run, etc., the content of a manifestation. Because my application profile tells me I'm using a structured description and I know I want to use the terms in the RDA toolkit, this, I will be using a term from this RDA vocabulary encoding scheme. Because I can use my own eyeballs to read the book, it is unmediated. Mode of issuance is a categorization reflecting whether a manifestation is used in one or more units. Again, because I'm using a structured description and the RDA vocabulary encoding scheme associated with it, I have to pick between multiple unit and single unit. I have a single volume, so I have a single unit. The carrier type is a categorization reflecting the format of the storage medium and housing of a carrier in combination with the type of intermediation device required to view, play, run, etc., the content of my manifestation. Again, I'm using the structured description and the terms in the toolkit. What's appropriate in my case is volume. The title proper. This is a title of manifestation that is selected for preference in a specific application or context. If I have an alternative title, I will treat it as part of the title proper. 
in this case it's an unstructured description, I'm transcribing it and I'm going to record a value of manifestation, title of manifestation. If I follow that link, I can find out what title of manifestation is and what instructions are there that apply to title proper. A title of manifestation is an appellation of manifestation in natural language and phrasing used in common discourse. And if I'm going to record an unstructured description in the title of manifestation, I use any source of information and record the form found in the source of information. That informs what I'm going to put in as the title proper. And the result is my decision for the title to be two words, biblio space tech. I also have other title information, a word, character, or group of words or characters that appear in conjunction with and subordinate to a title proper of a manifestation. Again, this is unstructured description, and I can record a value found in the source of information using any transcription scheme. I'm using normalized. And I'll record it if it appears on the same source of information as the title proper and apply those same instructions at title of manifestation. I don't have to look that up because I just saw it. So the result is why libraries matter more than ever in the age of Google. SOR, I apologize for the abbreviation, it's Statement of Responsibility, relating to the title proper. The definition and scope here, a statement of responsibility that is associated with the title proper. That's pretty straightforward. A statement of responsibility relating to the title proper does not include a statement of responsibility relating to an edition or a series. That's because there are separate elements for each of those. So this only has to do with a statement of responsibility relating to the title proper. Again, it's transcribed. It's an unstructured description. And I'm going to apply the general guidelines on recording statement of responsibility at manifestation statement of responsibility. And I'll record one or more statements that identify the creators of expressions or works embodied by a manifestation. What do those statement of responsibility instructions look like? Well, the statement of responsibility definition and scope is a statement that identifies and indicates the function of an agent who is responsible for a work or its expression that is embodied by a manifestation. A statement of responsibility may include words or phrases that are neither names nor linking words. When recording an unstructured description, I record a value found in the source of information using any transcription scheme. A reminder, I'm using the normalized transcription scheme. So my result is John Palfrey. The variant title of manifestation is a title that's not selected for preference in a specific application or context. That will also be recorded as a value of manifestation, title of manifestation. And I will be recording something that I think is important for identification that differs from the preferred title. You may remember that I said I was going to have to choose between bibliotech as one word and bibliotech as two words. So in my opinion, or my cataloger's judgment, it's important to collapse that into a single word. You may also remember the typography put tech in all caps in the title page. So I've decided to make the distinction by putting a capital T in when I close up this word. That is my cataloger's judgment. Moving on to place of publication, not surprisingly, it is a place associated with the publication, release, or issuing of a published manifestation. My application profile tells me to record this as an unstructured description, and therefore I'll be recording it as a name of place. And you see that in this case, I'm not applying two options. These two options contradict each other. I can either record the unstructured description by using guidelines on basic transcription or by using guidelines on normalized transcription. So sometimes you can add options together and other times they, it's one or the other. In this case, as you know, I'm using the normalized transcription. Investigating name of place a little further, this is an appellation of place in natural language and phrasing using common discourse. As before, I can use any source of information and record the form that I found on that source. This results in New York, which is what I'm sure you all expected. The name of publisher is a name of agent who is responsible for publishing a manifestation. 
and it's a helpful scope that publication includes release and issuance. Again, I'm using an unstructured description because my application profile tells me to do that. It would be possible to record this as an access point instead or in addition to this unstructured description, but that's not what I'm doing here. Here are these same two options to transcribe using basic transcription or normalized transcription. And because I've already followed through some of these other things, the result is the basic books, a member of the Perseus Books group. Date of publication. It's a time span during which a published manifestation is published, released, or issued. I have two choices in recording this element. It's either an appellation of time span or as an IRI. Because I'm not using linked data, it's definitely an appellation of time span. And I'm going to apply the general instructions for manifestation, date of manifestation, which you can see is here, the time span during which a published manifestation is published, released, issued, printed, duplicated, cast, distributed, etc or an unpublished manifestation is inscribed, fabricated, constructed, etc. You can see this is clearly a broader element than date of publication. I will be recording it as an unstructured description because that's the choice in my application profile. And it will be name of time span. Well, what's name of time span? That's an appellation of time span in natural language and phrasing used in common discourse. When I record an unstructured description, this option looks very familiar now. I can use any source of information and record the form found in the source. I have one other problem, though. My manifestation only had a copyright date and no publication date. In this case, I'm using my catalogers judgment to assume that the copyright date is the actual year of publication. Your catalogers judgment may vary. This is my catalogers judgment. So if I believe that is the condition, then my option is to record the year and also to indicate that the information was not taken from a manifestation that's being described. That I'm doing based on either my application profile, my policy statements, or something else that my way of doing that is to put it in square brackets. The extent of manifestation is a number and type of unit or subunit of a manifestation. The pre-recording instructions here help clarify what these are. A unit includes a volume, audio cassette, film reel, a map, a digital file, etc. So I have a single volume, that's my unit. Subunits in my volume, well that would be a page of a volume or if I didn't have a book, a frame of a microfiche or a record in a digital file. In this case, it's a structured description because I'm taking pieces of information and putting them in a structured order. I have to scroll down to find extent of text. And that says, for a printed or manuscript manifestation consisting of text with or without illustrative content, record an extent by applying the following instructions. These instructions apply to text manifestations in volumes, sheets, portfolios, or cases. These instructions also apply to volumes consisting primarily of still images. Well, my volume consists of pages, principally text, so I'm definitely covered here. Then I need to scroll down a little bit farther on the page till I come to the instruction headed by single volume with numbered pages, leaves, or columns. This condition obviously fits my manifestation. I have a single volume. And here the option tells me how to deal with these sequences. Record an extent in terms of pages, leaves, or columns according to the type of sequence used in the manifestation. A sequence of pages, leaves, or columns is a separately numbered group of pages, etc., or an unnumbered group of pages, etc., that stands apart from other groups in the manifestation, or a number of pages or leaves of plates distributed throughout the manifestation. Thankfully, the first bullet is the only one that applies to my publication. There's still more that I need to check. Apply the following guidelines. The volume is numbered in terms of pages. That's what I have. I don't have leaves. I don't have columns. I have pages. Record the number of pages. That's pretty straightforward. However, I also have some preliminary pages in a separate sequence. And here's the second condition that applies in that case. 
the volume consists of sequences of leaves and pages, or pages in numbered columns, or leaves in numbered columns. And the option is to record each sequence. Ultimately, I end up with Roman numeral 7, 280 pages. Dimensions. They're a measurement of carrier or a container of a manifestation. Dimensions include measurements of height, width, depth, length, gauge, and diameter. Under recording, I see that I record dimensions in centimeters to the next whole centimeter up and use the metric symbol CM unless instructed otherwise. In this particular case, I'm not instructed otherwise, so that's what I will be doing. If I scroll down to volumes, I find the condition that applies in my case. A value of manifestation carrier type is volume. We discovered that earlier on. The option is to record the height of the volume. By rounding up, the result is 22 centimeters. Identifier for manifestation. This has a broader, def longer anyway, definition and scope than we've seen with other of elements in this section. It's an appellation of manifestation that consists of a code, number, or other string, usually independent of natural language and social naming conventions, used to identify a manifestation. An identifier for the manifestation includes registered identifiers from internationally recognized schemes, other identifiers assigned by publishers, and others following internally devised schemes, identifiers known as fingerprints constructed by combining groups of characters from specified pages of early printed resources, publishers' numbers for notated music, and plate numbers for notated music. In my particular case, I have an ISBN. I will be recording this element as a value of a nomen entity, and I will be recording that value in a specified display format for a specific identifier vocabulary encoding scheme. And thankfully, it's very clear ISBN is right there in this option, so I know that's what I'm doing. Based on my current understanding, the standard display of an ISBN includes the dashes. This could be overridden by an application profile, but for the purposes of today, I will be recording the identifier with the ISBN dashes. I didn't really point this out in the title page verso when you saw it before, but there was the Library of Congress cataloging and publication block there and that listed both a hardcover and a paperback ISBN. So in fact, I, there is more one, than one identifier for the manifestation. I will be deciding just to record the one for the hardback, but to lessen confusion and to point anyone, probably more of you as catalogers than users looking specifically for paperback, I will be putting a qualifier in. I'm allowed to do that. So in recording an identifier, there, there's an option here to use a vocabulary encoding scheme as a source of information and record the identifier found in the source of information without modification. There's also an option to use any source of information and record the identifier found in the source. As I mentioned, I was going to be using the hyphens, and I've added parentheses HBK after it to indicate that it belongs to the hardback as opposed to the paperback version. So here's the complete manifestation metadata description set for Bibliotech. We talked to about each one of these elements and how I got what I got. Moving on then, let's take a look at person elements. The first step is to check the authority file, whichever one is appropriate for use, your use as a cataloger, to see if the person is established there. If you find that, that individual has an authority metadata description set, then apply the instructions under authorized access point for person when you're creating your own description. And use catalogers judgment to determine if there are any additional variants to add to that data set, applying the instructions under variant access point for person. However, if you don't find a corresponding record or metadata description set for the person, then you will need to work through the required and optional elements in the application profile to create the metadata description set that you need for the individual author. Luckily for me in this case, I found 
the Library of Congress NACO Authority file record for John G. Palfrey, who is in fact the author of this book. That means I get to skip over the whole creation questions about putting together a metadata description set for my author. And I get to just jump to authorized access point for person, which is an access point that is selected for preference in a specific vocabulary encoding scheme. I'll record the value that I find in that re vocabulary recording scheme. And just checking that access point for person is appropriate here. An appellation of person in natural language that is taken from a vocabulary encoding scheme or is constructed using a string encoding scheme. And just the note in pre-recording that an access point may be either an authorized access point for person or a variant access point for person. And that loops me right back to the element I started with. My result is, in fact, what you saw on the previous screen, Paul Free, comma, John G., John Gorham, 1972-. That allows me to move on to work elements. Author person. This is going to be an important part of my access point. So I need to make sure I've got this straight. This is a person who is responsible for a textual work creation of a new work by paraphrasing, rewriting, or adapting works by another creator if the modification has substantially changed the nature and content of the original or changed the medium of expression is included. This is a structured description, and I will be using a structured description for a related person using person access point for person. Well, we already know what that is, so it's the same as before. Moving on to preferred title of work is a title of work that is selected for preference in a specific application or context. This will be recorded as a value of a nomen entity, and I will record a value of manifestation title proper of a manifestation that embodies a work. We already know what I decided the title proper was, which was a good reason to start with manifestation. And I'll be recording an unstructured description recording a value of work, title of work, and record the value that appears most frequently in sources of information. Checking out title of work, this is an appellation of work in natural language and phrasing using common discourse. It will be recorded as the value of a nomen entity and will be recorded as value of manifestation, title of manifestation of the manifestation that embodies a work that loops back again to the title proper discussion we had earlier. And as with often with unstructured descriptions, I can use any source of information and record the form found in that source. That gets me back to Biblio space tech. For the same reasons I wanted to record the variant title of the manifestation, I want to record the variant title of the work. Right now that seems redundant, but if addition, additional additions are created or it's translated, whatever, these really are different elements, even though we're going to end up with the same character string. The variant title of work is one that is not selected for preference in a specific application or context. It includes a title or form of title appearing on a manifestation of the work and, or found in reference sources, a title resulting from a different transliteration of a title, etc. It's a title of work, which we covered under preferred title, and it will be recorded because I, in my cataloger's judgment, consider it important for identification because it differs from the preferred title and could affect individuals searching for it. So back to Biblios, tech is one word with a capital T. The extension plan is new in the beta toolkit. This is the categorization reflecting an intention to extend the content of a work. This is a structured description, and I will simply note that static plan is the only one on this list that does not have to do with diachronic works. Thank goodness I picked a simple monograph. My result is a static plan because this particular publication was not planned to be issued over time, and it was planned to be issued in just the single volume that I have. I have a static plan. Authorized access point for work, I've hinted at before. This is an access point for work that is selected for preference in a specific vocabulary encoding scheme. You can record a value that's selected within that encoding scheme as an authorized form of work access point for work. Well, that actually indicates that perhaps I should have started this whole section with saying 
is there an authority record or metadata description set, a work record description set, that corresponds with my work? Alas, I already knew that, that it does not, at least not in the authority file that I use. It is represented in VIAF, but actually I disagree with the form of preferred title, so it's just as well I'm not using VIAF. I can record a value of work access point for work, or I can construct an access point by applying the string encoding scheme to the values of one or more elements. That's actually what I need to do, because it's not represented in my authority file. I will record a value that's based on work preferred title of work, which is one of the reasons I needed to know that first. And because I have an additional element for single creator, it's so single work created by one agent, here's why I need to know the access authorized access point for the agent and the access point for the work and the preferred title of work, because I'm going to combine those two things together to get my access point which is Palfrey, John G., parentheses, John Gorham, 1972-Bibliotech. That's great. So now, what about a variant access point? Well, if I thought the variant title was important enough to record uh, earlier in this metadata description set for the work, I also think the access point is important. So I'm going to follow the same instructions, except in this case, I'm going to be recording a value of an access point that supports the user tasks find and identify in a specific context or application. And I will be using that same string encoding scheme to create the value. Not surprisingly, my variant title access point will include a title that's based on a title of the work. And I come back again to single work by one agent. Those are my conditions. And in this case, I've got an authorized access point for the agent. That's going to be the same. And a value that's based on title of work that's not the preferred title. And if necessary, I can add additional elements or designations as appropriate. All I really need to do is close up that space. And I prefer to capitalize that T in tech, as you know. Subject, a topic that a work is about. This is pretty straightforward in recording a structured description. It just is what I do. This time I followed the link to the recording a structured description guidance chapter, which says that there are five kinds of structured description. And what I'm using is the fourth one, a term for a concept taken from a controlled vocabulary. You can see that other structured descriptions are access points, structured notes, name or title from an authority system, and a value associated with the structured data type. But in this case, I'm just taking terms from the Library of Congress subject headings. If I remember correctly from the cataloging and publication data, there are six. Here then is my complete work metadata description set. My author, my preferred title and variant title, the extension plan, the authorized access point, and the variant access points, and the subjects. This leads finally to the expression elements. My preferred title of expression is a title of expression that is selected for preference in a specific application or context. I'm going to be recording this as an unstructured description, and I can use it based on the preferred title of the work. I could use it based on the title proper, or I can just record a value as title of expression. Well, thankfully, my preferred title of work and my title proper are both the same. So I have Biblio space tech. Content type. This is familiar. It's a categorization reflecting the fundamental form of communication in which the content is expressed and the human sense through which it is intended to be perceived. Content type also reflects the number of spatial dimensions and the presence or absence of movement in which content expressed in the form of an image or images is intended to be perceived. I'm going to be using a structured description using the RDA vocabulary encoding scheme, which is a very long list. And I scroll down to find what I need, which is text. Language of expression is a language used for the content of an expression. I will be using a structured description here and recording a term from a suitable vocabulary encoding scheme. In this particular case, I went to ISO 639-2 where they've got three-letter codes and two-letter codes, and one column is 
English name of language. And I thought that's really what I want to use here because I want to spell out the word English in this case. So that is what I decided was my suitable vocabulary encoding scheme and the result. Date of expression is a time span that is the earliest one associated with the expression. A date of expression may include a date a text was written, a date of final editing of a moving image work, a date of first broadcast for a television or radio program, a date of notation for a score, a date of the recording of event, etc. As you may recall, I didn't have a specific date of publication. I decided it was 2015 based on the copyright date, but I don't have a specific date of expression for my particular publication here. So I'll be recording a date of the earliest known manifestation that embodies an expression. Well, I decided that was 2015. And I'll be recording an unstructured description for a related time span as a value of time span, name of time span. We've been back through to the name of time span for the publication date. So my result is 2015. Why isn't it in square brackets? Because this is about the expression and not about the manifestation. I don't have to put something in brackets about an expression because there isn't anything that I could put it in brackets about. If you did that, everything for expression would need to be in brackets because in bra expressions have to be embodied by manifestations. Supplementary content is an indication of content that updates or complements the primary content of an expression. Supplementary and content includes an index, a bibliography, or an appendix, and so forth. This, in fact, has supplementary content. And my option is to record the nature of that content. In other words, its type, extent, location within the resource. Provide this information if considered important for identification or selection. I always think that including information about bibliographies and indexes is important to at least some users. So I always include that. It will be recorded as an unstructured description. And my result is a standard note, at least in North America, includes bibliographical references, pages 261 to 270, and index. I will note that this is the only thing in any of my metadata description sets that tells you that I'm working with an aggregate. I have chosen only to use this because it's the only part that I think is important. It is not important to identify who wrote the bibliography, who created the index. I probably don't know either of those. And they certainly don't need to be described separately. However, as I said, from my perspective, I think at least some users want to know this. And that's why it's there. Authorized access point for expression is new in the beta toolkit. And what I come up with here is creative at best. <laughs> so just let's assume that it's working this way. It's an access point for the expression that's selected for preference in a specific vocabulary encoding scheme. You can record a value that's selected within a vocabulary encoding scheme. So if there was an, an authority record, if you will, or a metadata description set for the expression that was already established. I could just record that and move on. I can record a value of expression access point for expression, or I can construct an access point by applying the string encoding scheme to the values of one or more elements, and I'll be doing the latter. The basis of my authorized access point is the preferred title of expression, which we've already determined. And I can include the value of the authorized access point for work, for the work that's realized by the expression. I really want to do that. I like seeing that my work and my expression have the same basis for the description. And then I will just add on things to the end of that string for my expression to make it distinct from the work access point. So if I'm going to add things, what are they? If I scroll down far enough, I find additional elements and designations in authorized access point for expression. Include values for other elements or designations in an access point if required to distinguish the access point from a value of an access point for another entity. In other words, my expression and my work shouldn't have the same access point. To assist in the identification of the entity and to conform to a string encoding scheme. Apply the options at expression access point for expression, additional elements and designations and access points for expression. 
Okay, let's follow that link and find out what I've got, Access Point for Expression, an appellation of expression in natural language that is taken from a vocabulary encoding scheme or is constructed using a string encoding scheme. Here's that option. Include values for other elements or designations in an access point if required. And there's those same bullets again. And here are just some of the options. They are the three that I decided to follow to include a value of expression for content type, for date of expression, and for language of expression. This has resulted in the following character string. Why am I using periods? Because my application profile told me to, or perhaps my best practices or my policy statement. As I said, there's no existing guidance about this and using punctuation or anything else in separating these data elements. I have chosen periods. My result is Paul Free, John G., John Gorham, 1972 Dash, Bibliotech, Text, 2015, English. So here is my met expression metadata description set. My preferred title, content type, language, date, supplementary content, and authorized access point. Now I said at the beginning that I was imagining a system that would relate all of these data sets together. Actually, RIMF, or RDA in many metadata formats, can do that for you if you enter the data there. And I did that for the purposes of making sure I had everything right for this presentation. I thought then that I would like to show you how RIMF presents these related metadata sets from work to expression to manifestation and to the author person who is associated with this. You'll see there that the manifestation of work has a heading or an access point that I didn't create for the purposes of this demonstration today. RIMF requires that for relating works to each other and having text to display. So what you're seeing there is Bibliotech English Basic Books 2015 would be a access point for the manifestation. I'm sorry that I can't be there to take your questions in person, but I would be happy to hear from you via email. If you do have questions, comments, please send it to my RSC chair account that you see here on the screen, and I thank you for your attention.